Don't you think Goldman Sachs is uh, pretty easy to understand? I never looked at it, but I know. The but, but why would I want to look at it? How much, does anyone have a Goldman Sachs annual report? I, I, I had it. Well, how much assets do you have? Well, I didn't. Uh, I don't remember. Is it more than five hundred billion? But I think the key is Goldman Sachs. How can, how can you ever figure out? Well, how can you ever figure out what's going on? <laughs> they are. The, I mean, it's just you know they got crap there, right? I, how, how can you ever figure out what's going well, on? Those are trading assets. They're pretty good traders. Right. And what what uh, what you could have said mm -hmm. in the fall of '98 or fall of 2008 mm -hmm. is that I think the assets are good on a DCF basis. So if you didn't have to sell them today, if there was no mark to market to live with, that these assets are good as they are, if the economy stabilizes. So if you make, if you say, well, you know, you don't have to, in other words, if you're not, if, you, if you're sure you're not going to be a poor seller, you don't, you don't have to liquidate. You can make an assumption that those assets are generally good, okay? Because let's face it, you know, you know, I would say that most mortgages, will, will, most prime mortgages are probably still going to pay off. I think Goldman Sachs doesn't take balance sheet risks, not much. It's hedging assets. Mainly, it's an investment bank. Who are you hedging? Business. There was no one left to the hedge trading against. Trading business. Oh, there's no one left to hedge against. They had tremendous counterparty risk. If, if, if the government did not step in that day, or in that September 2008, they would have been gone. The whole system would have been collapsed. There would have been. Trust me. There would have been. What was going on with the money markets? Okay, which was linked to. As soon as Lehman fell, and the reserve primary fell. Okay, and it broke the buck and went down to 97 cents. Okay, no one was lending to anyone on the overnight. Payrolls within two weeks would have been missed. Companies would have declared bankruptcy. Okay, major companies would say we are technically insolvent, although we just can't pay for this day. If you just wait until we get our receivables, fear builds upon fear. It would have been ugly. No one knew what was going on. That's why I'm saying, trying to say. Who was the car party risk? It was AIG. It was Morgan Stanley, right? It, it's J.P. Morgan, because those are the only guys left. It's Citibank. All those guys were going to go down to soup together, right? Because if you all of a sudden thought that mark to market was the real value, and that's what and that's what the government was saying, right? Because that's the apparently the best information available. Then all those guys would have had, a, you know, it would have been over very quickly. So. Um, you would have to make an assumption that those assets were good, and I, you know, and I would, you know, I would probably say, uh, you know, if you had like mostly prime A mortgage assets, that you probably weren't going to lose more than five percent as a portfolio over a, a cumulative loss for a long period of time. So, because it was a payoff, but on a mark-to-market basis, and I'm just making these numbers up, they were being marked down 10, 15 percent. So and all of a sudden your, your equity base is, is negative, right? Because if your equity base, if you have 5% equity to assets, okay, and, you're, and all of a sudden because Lehman failed and they're a forced seller and they have to sell all their similar assets to you at fire sale prices and they're marked down, you know, 10, you know, 10 percent. Let's say they're marked down 85%, but on a DCF basis, on a discounted cash flow basis, it's worth 95, which you can wait, but on a fire sale basis, it's worth 85. You're technically insolvent. The government comes in, shuts you down, and it's, it's game over. So, but, but I think Goldman Sachs doesn't do lending business. You are right. Counterparty risks. Yeah, Com counterparty risks. But they're not in the lending business. But they're they leveraged. Well, so they, that makes them uh, weak money. Yeah, they're leveraged. You can't have seven. You don't unless they have seven. I'm just making up this number. Unless they have seven hundred billion dollars in tangible equity, they're lending. Someone is lending money to them. And therefore, they are weak money. One day, they live by the kindness of strangers every day of their life. For the last 120 years, every night, they go to the overnight market, and they bend on their good name that they're going to pay it back in the morning. And that's how Lehman did it until one day in September 2008. That's how Bear Stearns did it until one day in March 2008. Okay, things change. I mean, what you think is normal doesn't mean it's normal. It can change. Electric car, as an aside, like Nissan's coming out with the electric car. So it's GM. Who's to say that that what the what's unbelievable now? Let's say electric cars, you know, become the become very common. Ten years from now, gas could be a buck fifty. No one sees that now, but it can absolutely happen. Also, we can attack Iran tomorrow, and gas could be at six bucks tomorrow. 
that can also happen. But no one thinks about it, but those two extremes are, are distinct possibilities. And that's, and that's, if it goes to six bucks, that's why you want a strong balance sheet. Because if it, gas goes to six bucks, there's going to be a lot more volatility everywhere. So. Is that the black swan? Yeah. That's why you want a, that's the reason why you want the strong balance sheet. And you read the guy's book, Nassim, what tally be, okay. You know, it's a very important lesson. The black swan, it's worth the price of the book alone just to understand what a black swan risk is. Everyone understand what a black swan risk is. It's a risk that you think is horrible and, and therefore you don't want to think about it and therefore you think it never happens, but it can happen. World Trade Center disaster on September 11th um, and things like that. And that's why you never know what's going to happen. And that's why, that's why it's very important always to have a strong balance sheet. So. so what's the debt level you can swallow? What type of company? For financials. So if you are afraid of debt, financial companies are pretty much ruled out. A lot of them are. <laughs> a lot of them are. But not, I, I bought an SNL just uh, two months ago, OBA Financial. Uh, it's, I don't know, I forgot, maybe 250 million in assets, maybe more, I don't remember. Uh, very vanilla. Doesn't have any alt label loans. They're not doing. They're expanding their commercial business, which is not very. It's very expensive and not. It has a negative, um, negative. It's value destructive at this point. Um, uh, but they don't have a bad. They have a good book. It's in Washington D.C. I mean, the good, I, I'm from Washington D.C. I live there now. Uh, and whether you agree with Obama or disagree with Obama, the one thing you can say is that Washington D.C. is the great beneficiary of it because all that government spending is going to go through D.C. in terms of contractors and therefore. The, Economy, the local economy around D.C., Maryland, Virginia are going to be benefited by all the spending. And OBA is a, a savings and loan with five branches throughout the D.C. area of Maryland and D.C. And so those assets are generally, you can make a bet that those assets are generally going to be good in those, in those local loans and stuff like that. Um, now, bought it, it, it's a terrible ROE business, doesn't earn any money, so you're not buying it for earnings. Um, after their, it's a demutualization basically that the depositors had a, a chance to participate in the IPO, and the, the IPO price was 10. I bought it at 10 um, in the aftermarket because it collapsed with the market this week. The equity assets are 20 percent. Again, 20 percent versus five for Citibank. Okay, so uh, and it's at 60 percent of the book. They're, they're well reserved. Now that doesn't mean they can't make a bunch of bad loans tomorrow. A bunch of loans that they made last year go bad now, but I'd rather take those chances and just have the guy buy back his shares over the next three years. Because so every time he's buying it below book, he's adding that, right? So if I look at it as a bond, I'm buying it at 60 cents. He buys back his shares, so it's worth 115 in three years because there's some kind of regulation that there's a limit of how many shares he can buy back, and then after the third year, he can buy back unlimited. So you assume that the manager would buy back as many shares as long as it's below book value, and that'll trade up book value in three years. So you try to guess the book value in three years. So let's say, a bad ROE business, so it goes from 100 to 115. So, for a little, very little risk, you, you go from 60 cents to 115 cents over three years. Not great, but it's not that much risk. What's the name again? OBA. Uh, the, OBA? Yeah, OBA. The ticker symbol is OBA. Uh. And by the way, it's not a recommendation to buy it. <laughs> None of the stocks I mentioned is a recommendation to buy that stock. I'm just explaining to you my thought process on why, on what I was thinking when I bought it. But something you're currently looking at now, like what? Or Not much. Um, like, you know, I pick up the value line today. I noticed that, uh, or not the value line, but Morningstar, that International Speedway is on, listed as a, a discount fair value on Morningstar. And I don't know what's going on with NASCAR TV audiences or NASCAR attendance, but generally, that, historically, that's had a good business. So I, I just, all I looked at was the tier sheet. I don't know anything more than that. You know, Fiserv seems cheap, but I passed on that. Uh, DST seems cheap, but I passed on that because they don't seem any cheaper than what I already own. And they seem like, I think you'll you'll make money on them. I think you'll make money on Fiserv. Fiserv is a very good business, it's trading at nine times even. But it's not exactly cheap. The market's been up six weeks in a row, and I just, it's kind of hard to buy, get excited about anything when the market's up six weeks in a row. Uh, 